you were trying out for the Journey softball team and they did you wrong, right? I'm just messing with Chuck tonight. But, but you know that feeling. I'm sure you've all felt it at one time or another where you're just around a group of people and you just feel like you don't fit in. There's something wrong and you start to feel inadequate and you start to feel less than and you start to feel like you're not a part of. See, God created in us this desire for community. And in our sin-stained lives, we often have those feelings because there is this longing to belong that he created in us as human beings as part of our DNA. We long for this healthy koinonia, this Christian community that we're talking about. But in our sin, we all feel inadequate to be a part of the thing that levels the ground is the cross of Jesus Christ. He levels it out for all of us where we all belong. We're all part of the family of God. We're all part of his story now. And then you hear the narrative change where all of a sudden he starts to use new words about us as this one new man. He starts to call us things like ambassadors for Christ. People who reflect the glory of God. That's you, that's me. He changes all that sin into something beautiful in our lives. You hear words describing broken community being put back together as members of the household of God, a dwelling place for the spirit. That's what that scripture was all about. And might that be part of the legacy of the people of Journey Church, a community of believers built on the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ and Christ alone, who go out there to the lost, the hurting, the broken, and usher them into the family of God that we all might grow together to be a part of his body perfected, ready for that wedding feast in heaven one day where we'll all get to hang out with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Diedrich Bonhoeffer writes, Christian community means community through and in Jesus Christ. We are all one under the blood of Jesus Christ. Could we be that beacon of hope? We belong to each other because we belong to Christ. So what is one of the purposes of Christian life and community? Paul puts it this way in Ephesians chapter 2. So in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, when we operate in this kind of Christian community that we're talking about, it shows the immeasurable richness of God's glory. We're a reflection of who he is. And that is irresistible, people. When they see that, people will be drawn unto what God is doing. So what does that mean? We need to sacrifice some of ourselves. We need to put sin in its past. You know, Jim got up here and shared that story of Lot. It was not a good ending for his wife. Right? Right? Because she wanted to hold on to the things of the past. She looked back, right? See, when God begins to remove those sins, I don't know about you, but I was riding on that bike today, and there was a moment that went through my mind, and I said, you know, my natural proclivity when I'm all by myself is to go back towards sinful things, to go to places of isolation, to go back to addiction, to go back to those things of old. But thanks be to God, he's changed my life. I need to stay connected to community. I need to stay connected to the cross of Jesus Christ, lest I go back to those things of the past. Because in our sinful nature, they will try to call back out to you from time to time. And what will be your defense? But Christ and Christ crucified. Can I get an amen? amen? So community is for us a declaration of the overwhelming love of God. A tangible proclamation of the reconciling work of the cross. This kind of community should be a living illustration of the gospel. And this kind of community we want to see birth here to the next degree at Journey Church. So let me give you a couple tangibles for a minute. We, we're talking conceptually here. So how does that need to flesh itself out in our everyday lives? How do we need to put these things into practice? We believe one of the primary avenues for that is our small groups, the groups that we have. And we, we talked about the fact that we have 34 different small groups that met this last semester. That's a good thing. That's many different opportunities for people to engage and plug in. But let me tell you, that's not enough to reach a lost and hurting generation and change the city. It's simply not. There's many interests that are being unmet in those groups. There's things that God has put on some of your hearts that he would have you do if you would only step out in faith. And I'm not telling you that you have to be some big leader that knows the Bible inside and out. In fact, you don't. You need to just love God with all your heart, strength, soul, and mind. 
and you need to have an interest that you might share with others. And, and what I try to tell people is that you're probably already doing it. You know, use that motorcycle group as an analogy again. They had a common interest of riding motorcycles. Now, how can you turn that into a gospel community? Well, they go and they ride with one another, but before they ride with one another, they pray with one another. They share one another's needs. They care for one another. They love on one another. They eat lunch together. They break bread with one another. So when they're there, they begin to have these conversations that can turn towards gospel conversations. And then all of a sudden, in the midst of that, some of them become friends and they begin to hang out with each other outside of that context. And they start to grow in their faith with one another. And if they're smart about it, they can also be on mission because there's a lot of people who ride motorcycles who are not believers believers in Jesus Christ whom they might invite into that group where they could experience the love of God by these other believers who are gathered together. So all of you, God has implanted in your DNA certain interests that might be leveraged for the kingdom of God. Some of you like to play softball. Some of you like to do deep Bible studies. Some of you like to do community. And uh, some of you like to do disaster relief. Some of you like to go out and feed the homeless. Some of you like to go out and play golf. Some of you like to go out and you name it. What do you like to do? What are you already doing? Could you turn that into something intentional for Christ? Would you consider officially doing it as a journey group? where we could bring you in and give you a couple tools to tell you how you might do it, how you might facilitate community in that context. We could equip you. You know, I go, l- let me share this with you. It, it's mind-blowing to me. We go to these groups like Acts 29. We go down to Orlando and we meet with these people. And you, you hear people who, I, I guess some of us have this fear that if we don't know the Bible inside and out, that God can't use us. And I'll, I'll see some of these resumes come across my desk and they'll have every single Christian word, and they got all the doctrine down perfect. I mean, they know everything. I'll take it even one degree further. We go into the jail, and you'll, the jail people know the gospel better than I know the gospel. I'm serious. But they can't apply it, right? But God does something with a willing heart where you don't need to have all the answers, but you just say, God, man, I love you. And you created me and you gave me this interest in thus and so, like in young married couples or in men's Bible studies or women's Bible studies or some common interest, and I want to use it for your glory, God. And guess what? He uses people like that to transform the world. He will use you in that context to make a difference if you'll only step out of your comfort zone and say, I'm willing, Lord. Remember Isaiah, use me. Use me, Lord. Will you use me? Would he give you that sense of desperation and would you step out in faith? In just a couple weeks, we're going to do some trainings. It's only one hour of your life. I'm going to encourage you when that training comes to sign up and check it out. You don't have to sign on the dotted line immediately, but see if God might use you as a facilitator of community. If he's already working in your heart, use your connection card tonight. Write it down and become a part of what God is doing because at our core, we are created for community. So you can live without it. You can live without community. You can live in isolation. You could go about that for a season of your life. It's not going to kill you literally, right? You could be an old miser in your house, right? Some of you are like, man, that sounds really good. <laughs> you know, like, but I think of people like my grandfather, you know, He never really made many friends. He liked to gamble. He liked to drink. In the later days of his life, family would come around sometimes, and we don't always like to talk about it, but he'd sit in that chair, and he'd just drink himself into oblivion, and he didn't have any friends. When it came time for his funeral, his family was there for him, but there was not anybody else that was around him because he drank himself into oblivion, and he lived his life in isolation. That's not what God created you for. He created you for community. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, he wants you to use you to reach out to lost and hurting people like him that they might receive the love of Christ and have their lives transformed and enter into that kingdom of heaven and be part of that wedding feast of God. Church, you were created and made for thriving, not just getting by. Why? Because you were created in the image and likeness of God. 
He wants you to be a reflection of who he is. He's alive inside of you by the power of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to do wonderful things in you and through you, and he wants to use you to touch others. Some of you, though, you need to get over some of that pain, over those difficulties, over that feeling of less than, and start to realize that you are ambassadors for Christ. You were created in his image, and he loves you, and he picked you and selected you and called you to be part of his team. And he wants to use you to touch the lives of others. See, if you're finding your identity in anything other than the finished work of the cross, then we need to measure our lives and our identity on something different. See, some of us, we're putting our hope in other things. We're even putting our hope in other communities. We're looking at them as functional and false saviors, and they'll fail us at times. But if you put your hope in him, you'll never be disappointed. You'll always feel a part of, you'll always feel loved. And he has a way of bringing the most diverse group of (laughs) motley crews around one another to love on one another and care for one another and be there for one another. See, the Bible said in Genesis, if you go back there to the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Notice the plurality of words that he used. See, God lived together in perfect community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinitarian God. He wants our lives to be an expression of who he is, that image and reflection of God to the world. Genesis chapter 2, he says, It's not good that man should be alone, not only the husband and wife relationship, but he wants us to live in community with other people because if you're not then there's no ironing, sharpening iron. There's no growing together. There's no accountability. There's no caring for and loving for. And I think deep down, we all long for that, even if we shy away from it because we're tainted by sin. See, for God's finished work on the cross to become true in our life, we need to submit to him. We need to repent. And it does make true community possible again. It allows the glory of God to shine through us and removes that sin-marred life as we begin to reflect the glory of God and live together in community. Can I get one more final amen? So reflecting God's glory is an obvious, important building block. We're created to um, glorify and live not for ourselves, but live for God. And through Christ, our self-centered natures are transformed back to what we were created for. See, self-centeredness, I still believe, is, is a deep thing that's at the heart of many of us in American Christianity because if you were like me, we grew up in a me generation. You know, it was all about me, um, self-made man. This is part of the American ethos gone bad. It's part of the sin portion that tainted who we are. We're all self-centered, and Christianity in many ways has become this consumer Christianity. It's all about, is the church taking care of our needs? Well, if all of us were stepping up, the needs would all be met in Jesus' name, right? You know?